both passionate about this understanding of the woman's cycle at this very foundational level. Join co-hosts Jamie Rauchy and Teresa Kenny as they educate women about the beauty of the feminine design and empower women to take charge of their health. I don't see how it's healthy to alter or suppress our feminine functions and call that women's health care. And welcome to the Hormone Genius Podcast. Today, I get to ask Teresa all about how the thyroid affects our hormones. And so the thyroid is a gland that I can say I have been least familiar with, um, but I have recently taken upon a huge interest in learning more. And um, just the more I learn about the thyroid, the more I realize women don't understand. I, I shouldn't speak so generally, but I didn't understand. And most people I talk to have a hard time understanding the thyroid's role. And I think it's because it's kind of complex. So we're going to um, break it down. I'm going to ask Teresa just to start, like, Teresa, tell us, like, what is the thyroid? Where is the thyroid? Let's just start with the context. Yeah. So the thyroid is a gland. It's a hormone secreting gland, and it is a butterfly shaped gland. That's right on like the sides of your voice box. So right near kind of that Adam's apple, mm -hmm. um, that men and women have women just have a smaller one and it's not very big, but it has a big job because it is the master gland of all energy. You could say it has to do with growth. So we do not grow appropriately when we were young, we would not get big. And to grow into an adult, it has to do with heart and um, just immune system, your uh, temperature regulation, heart regulation. It is the master gland of everything really hormonally. So super important that thyroid is. And um, I think a lot of women have questions about thyroid and, um, you know, really want to know more. And I used to joke, um, I don't so much anymore because I even... I think I've just even learned more about the thyroid, but I used to joke, I would put a sign above my, um, you know, my office door, like when patients would come in, it would say, it's really not your thyroid <laughs> because I've had so many women come in and be like, I think my thyroid is off because I'm tired all the time and I've gained weight and da da da. And I wish it was, I could fix everything by giving you thyroid medication. But the fact is, is that most of the time it's really not your thyroid and, um, there's other things going on, but, uh, there is many women who suffer from thyroid, um, conditions, hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, suboptimal thyroid. And that's what we really want to kind of get into today is how do I know, what to do when I go to my doctor? How do I advocate for myself? What are the right blood tests? How do I understand this disease? When is it appropriate to use medication? When is it not? You know, like Jamie is going to ask me some questions and we're just going to get into the nitty gritty of all that. Yes. Oh my gosh. I really, Teresa, I want you to share with everybody a little bit of history about the little pandemic -y thyroid issue from the early 1900s. So yeah. Yeah. So and this yes, is like mind blowing to yes. James. I told her the first time, but it's my, it was mind blowing to me when I read it, but, um, we often don't know historically how common hypothyroidism was or, um, commonly knowing, known as a goiter. Um, we hear this word goiter just means that that little gland around the neck is like getting bigger and bigger because it's trying to function, but it's not, it's not working because it doesn't have what it needs to function basically. Well, back in the early 1900s, and this is around the world war one and the great depression, um, there was a epidemic of goiters occurring and scientists were trying to figure out what was going on. And there was a particular even area of the United States um, that was called the goiter belt because it was so significantly deficient in that area. And there was some scientists that were recognizing all of these patients that were coming in um, all had these big necks. And ultimately it came down to, they figured finally out that there is an element in our soils. There's an element that is in our diet and there's an element in the earth. You could say that is so vital to the thyroid that if you don't get enough of it, your thyroid will not function. And that element is iodine and iodine. Um, you know, it is so essential. It is literally, it's only job in the human body is to make the thyroid work. So it's extremely important. And if you don't have it, you will start to develop symptoms of hypothyroidism. Well, back in the 1920s, iodine deficiency was extremely common. It was not um, something that we got in our diets very easily because 
you know, it's normally in things like sea kelp and seaweed and, um, lots of animal sources. So it just wasn't, it wasn't present enough. And so people were suffering because of that. So the government, after research scientists figured this out, iodine deficiency was like a major issue. They put it into something known as salt. And we, what we know is table salt. And when you go to the store and you see that iodized salt, iodized salt was a very, very, uh, you know, it was a very, very overwhelmingly government enacted policy to prevent hypothyroidism. And so it was an easy way because salt is cheap. Everybody uses salt and it was an easy way to get iodine into people's bodies. And they cured this epidemic of, uh, of goiters basically by putting it in table salt. And they also put it in, I think in some other foods like grains, like bread that everybody buys too. Never had I known that. Tell me about, tell the listeners about fluoride. Yeah. So fluoride, uh, so there's a couple of things that are going on in the United States now where we're seeing a little bit of more of transient goiters, transient hypothyroidism. Um, and one is fluoride. So fluoride also an element, but, um, you know, a competing element in the body to iodine and, um, with fluorid fluoridizing or fluoridization of, um, in dental therapy. So you remember when we were young, every time we went to the dentist, after they clean your teeth, you would ask, you know, what flavor of fluoride you wanted to be put in your mouth. Well, actually for some people that can be very dangerous because it actually competes with iodine and can kind of knock it off its um, cell and you can have some issues there. Now they've backed off the amount of fluoride they do for children. So I don't know if that was why, but there may be some other issues too, but it's also in our water system. So, you know, again, it just more um, evidence that we need to be very, uh, you know, important to know how much iodine we're getting and have the right requirements for it. And here's the other thing too, is like table salt. A lot of us don't use anymore. We use sea salt, kosher salt, you know, that actually the trace elements of iodine are less in. So there have been some issues with just people getting, you know, less iodine in general in the current state of eating. Um, and then thirdly is our soil is depleted of all trace elements because of pesticides, herbicides, and just the changes that are happening in the earth. We are not getting as many trace minerals and iodine would be one of those in the soil as well as magnesium and copper and other things. But, um, that's another reason why we sometimes have to be more diligent to make sure we're getting it. Totally. Oh my gosh. I just, my mind is blown with that. Um, before we talk about the hormones specifically with the thyroid, um, when I was talking Teresa about this a couple weeks ago, she's talking about like, even with heart disease, uh, you want to talk a little bit about heart disease and how, um, you know, we're told again to reduce the sodium, you know, levels for, for caring for our heart, but then what, how we can balance that with what we know about the thyroid. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we, we've all heard salt can be bad for blood pressure. And, um, you know, in the 1980s, there was this thing, a very strong kind of like get, everybody should get off salt. And, um, and that was to the detriment of the thyroid in many cases, salt is essential, you know, sodium is essential in our bodies for all cellular interaction. So there's always a balance of everything, but you can actually put yourself in heart disease by not getting enough thyroid, um, which actually can lead to congestive heart failure. And it's of course, as our bodies age, it's even more important because we just don't have the, the, you know, the ability to compromise for those things anymore. Um, but yes, it's, it was another area where we were seeing some problems with hypothyroidism when, you know, there was such a strong push for everyone to get off sodium. How fun. I love that little fact. Um, okay. So Teresa, now let's talk about thyroid and yeah. hormones. How does our thyroid affect the symphony of our hormones? Yes. Well, I'm going to tell you a story because it's a story that really impacted me because it was my one and only sister who developed thyroid issues. And it was always just really heartbreaking for me, but just to set up kind of a typical thyroid patient, I'm going to tell you her story. But, um, my sister was an incredible athlete. She's 18 months um, younger than me. Incredible athlete. We, we, we both played all sorts. Our dad was a big time football player, but she was really amazing. And she played soccer and basketball and volleyball and everything. But there was a point when she probably hit past her starting her period around her mid teens, where she started to gain weight and she started to feel more sluggish. Now my parents, you know, my dad had struggled with the weight a little bit, so they just thought it was genetics. And, um, her tiredness was honestly, we thought it was laziness. 
Mm-hmm. We thought it was her temperament and that she was just lazy. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, she struggled for many years and I'll never forget in college, we played soccer together. We were in a small, um, uh, college and loved playing soccer with Kathy. Um, and, but she struggled sometimes just with keeping her energy up and she was amazing. My, my sister is the, in the hall of fame at Briarcliff college where we went to school for oh my soccer. Gosh. And it is all still, in light of the fact that she had been suffering probably with hypothyroidism for at least five to six years and didn't know it. And so it's really sad. What was she experiencing? And I, and I didn't realize it. And I was the one who finally picked up on it, but it wasn't until I was out of nursing school. You know, it was, wasn't until I was educated and my parents are not medical, so they didn't know. Um, and I was like, wow, Kathy, you've struggled with your weight for a long time. Your hair is really dry, brittle, you, um, you're tired all the time, uh, brain fog, just everything kind of all of a sudden hit me. I'm like, Kathy, you should need, you need to get your thyroid checked. And sure enough, her thyroid was way, way off. And and it makes me sad because I think about all those years that she suffered and we all thought it was just her and, you know, Mm -hmm. not, it wasn't her fault. Mm -hmm. And she had this condition that was going on. So that's the typical symptoms of thyroid, um, that weight gain, hair, dry, brittle, nails, brittle, skin, dry, feeling cold all the time, feeling sluggish, feeling low, depressed, just Mm -hmm. low, uh, just, uh, constipation, sluggishness of the bowels. Um, it's a slowing of the body. And this is the most common issue that we have for women is low thyroid when it gets diagnosed. So it's hard to get diagnosis sometimes because you could go into your doctor and you could say all those things and be like, well, you're just depressed, Mm -hmm. you know? Or, you know, it might just be because you're stressed out or whatever. So women can get kind of misdiagnosed or not uh, given the appropriate test. Now, in my sister's situation, what did she need to diagnose her? Well, first and foremost, she needed one thing, just at least a screen, her thyroid. And that's the thyroid stimulating hormone, otherwise known as a TSH. The TSH is like your gas pedal of the thyroid. When your thyroid is not making enough hormone, the TSH increases to try to push the gas pedal down to get your body to produce more thyroid hormone. And if your thyroid is producing too much thyroid hormone, the TSH is taking its foot off the gas and it's slowing the production of thyroid stimulating hormone. TSH is not like the active hormone that's doing like all of the metabolism work. It's just the kind of gauge, the one telling it how much to be producing on any given day, but a TSH, it's kind of the reverse thing that you think about. If it goes really high, that means that your thyroid is not answering to the job. And that means that you have a thyroid that's not producing the right amount of of hormone. So your TSH could be like 22 and that would be severe hypothyroidism. It tells us right away that there's something wrong. Now you need more blood tests to know what's going on actually in the thyroid gland in terms of how much thyroid hormone it's producing. 90% of what our thyroid gland produces is T4. 10% of it is what is called T3. But the key is, is that all T4 actually has to get converted to T3 to actually be used in the cellular level. So you get this thyroid hormone circulating in the body and then through the gut, through the liver, through different processes that gets converted to its active form, which is T3. But we have to measure both of those in the body to know how much T4 and T3 is being produced, how much is bound and unbound in the body to really get a good sense of kind of the bigger picture. And um, so that's a lot of times a TSH you might start with as a screening, but I generally am going to do for the most patients who are very symptomatic, a full panel to look at the bigger picture. Now people will ask, well, what causes thyroid problems? You know, the vast majority of thyroid problems for women are what we call autoimmune and autoimmune. You've probably heard of autoimmune issues, but it's for thyroid. It's basically that you start circulating these kind of anti-thyroid antibodies and they are circulating through the body, but they particularly have an affinity for attacking the thyroid gland and they can cause inflammation in the thyroid gland. And originally when people develop thyroid antibodies, if they have like a 
a huge surge of thyroid antibodies. They actually can become hyperthyroid to begin with. So it's like their thyroid is getting inflamed. It's like, oh my gosh. And it starts to produce more hormone. Um, and that even can be a condition called Graves disease, where it's a thyroid condition where it's overproducing thyroid hormone. <laughs> but eventually most people, even with hyperthyroidism, that autoimmune response will basically destroy the thyroid's function and they will become hypothyroid. Um, now the other condition that's autoimmune is known as Hashimoto's and Hashimoto's again, producing thyroid antibodies against the thyroid gland. And that causes a disruption in the thyroid gland. You can produce thyroid antibodies for years before you ever develop symptoms and before you ever developed abnormal thyroid function tests. So I like to test thyroid antibodies on women who are having fertility issues, women who are having thyroid symptoms. Maybe they have it in their family history, just because if you can see the thyroid antibodies early enough, you can actually do some things to put, to reverse that, to really calm the thyroid um, down in that situation. So what does somebody do? So if they, if they have lab work, that's way crazy town. Of course, there's medication that doctors may prescribe, but what are some natural ways to help with that autoimmune response? So what we have to do is think of that response as an inflammatory response. And we have to ask ourselves what is causing inflammation in the body. And, you know, one of the key things is my, my diet. Can my diet be an influence inflammation in my body? And if you read anything about thyroid, you'll hear sometimes conflicting things. Western medicine sometimes doesn't believe diet has anything to do with thyroid, but that's not true. We know diet has everything to do with all of our health. Yeah. So from a common sense standpoint, we know that this is important. Um, first and foremost, it's just getting out the crap, the processed foods, the chemicals in our food, right? The chemicals in our body can influence everything. Mm -hmm. So we have to get those things out, but there is, a lot of literature to show that both gluten and dairy can be problematic for thyroid patients, gluten, probably more um, than even dairy, not every patient. And it also has to do with sometimes the way that gluten is processed. So we have a highly processed way we make bread and there's even chemicals that are put into the bread. So it's, it's like tainted gluten almost. That's the problem. Not necessarily that just gluten and wheat itself is bad, but we find that patients that come off of gluten, do feel better and their antibodies can decrease being off gluten. Same thing with dairy. And again, it's an individual patient decision and you have to really look at a lot of factors. Mm -hmm. Diet um, is key, but then we have to look at those trace minerals and elements and what a body's deficient in as well. We know that patients who are deficient in iodine obviously can have problems. Now, iodine's tricky, and people will hear all sorts of things on the internet about, you know, using like Lugol solution, which is like this just iodine dropper solution, and taking high amounts of iodine. That can be really dangerous. So I, I would be very wary of of taking iodine in any sort of a dramatic way. We know that the human adult body needs 150 micrograms of iodine daily. And often you can find that in some multivitamins, but even standardly prenatal vitamins should have iodine in them because it's so important for a pregnant woman to have their thyroid function for the fetus. The, the baby relies on the woman's thyroid function in order for their thyroid function to be normal. But even in some prenatal vitamins, it's not there. So really look at your vitamin, your multivitamin. Does it have 150 micrograms of iodine? That would be the bare minimum. You, know, you also can get it from your diet though. And I would encourage getting it from the diet more than again, just starting to take a bunch of iodine, which actually in excess can be harmful. So there's always a balance, but there are the second most important nutrient to the thyroid is selenium and selenium helps with the body's ability to convert T4 to T3, but it also helps in that inflammatory response and decreasing the um, antibodies as well. So hundred to 200 micrograms of selenium is really essential for the thyroid to function adequately. And you can get that from the diet. Of course, nuts are a great source of selenium. In fact, sometimes what I'll tell my patients is five Brazil nuts a day is all you need to get adequate selenium. So if you like Brazil nuts, you know, that's a perfect way to, to get your selenium daily. But for my thyroid patients, I actually have them get a supplement. I usually have 200 micrograms of selenium just to make sure. And I've even had people who were 
all over the board with their levels. Maybe um, their TSH just kept fluctuating every time we tested it. They also were kind of like not doing well on their medicine. Like they were having heart palpitations and just not feeling well. Get them on selenium and smooth it all out. So that's interesting. It's how important selenium is. Other nutrients that are important are zinc, mm -hmm. B vitamins like folate and B12, and um, also vitamin D, super important to the thyroid. And we know that practically everybody is vitamin D deficient. So that's an easy one for everyone to be taking 2000 IUs of vitamin D daily, D3. And, um, you know, what I'll do is I'll actually sometimes just recommend these thyroid support supplements, Jamie, because they have it all in it. You know, again, we can't be taking like 50 bottles of vitamins. It's, it's really frustrating and expensive to do that. So like, I like the brand pure encapsulations. They have a thyroid support. I work with a compounding pharmacy that makes a thyroid support supplement. So often I'll use these kind of complexes that have all those things that I know are important in them. Um, so they can get it all. That's awesome. Okay. So Teresa, I'm going to recap the, this kind of like pathway. Um, and then tell me if this is right. Okay. So the brain produces TSH or does the thyroid produce TSH? The brain does, right? The brain, the hypo, the HPA access. HPA um, access. So the yep. brain produces TSH, communicates to the thyroid that TSH produce or um, communicates to the thyroid. Thyroid produces then from the TSH, like a baton exchange, 90% of like T4 and then 10% T3. And then T4 is inactive, which means it's not, we're not quite there yet. And then it sends T4, T4 is sent to like our organs, like our liver, mm -hmm. kidneys, adrenals, gut, all those things. And then there's a message that gets sent back from the, um, or those organs to back to the liver, um, in an active form of T3. Is that right? I think that's right. Yeah. So they then we it. know, we know then that the function and the health of those organs are essential for our thyroid health. So it's like, it's a two way relationship where the organs have to be in good working order. So it can send it back in a sense, you know, um, because it's converting it and then the mm -hmm. thyroid needs to be healthy so that it can send the message in the first place. So maybe Teresa, will you talk about the importance of, we'll talk, we'll start with fertility first. Like what are those fertility cases that you're seeing where the thyroid's really affecting, um, fertility? Yeah. And how does that work? Yeah. So it, it's just, it's really so important for fertility. Um, and we've, you know, there's been studies that have linked even a sub clinical low thyroid. And we're talking like most of the time when you go to the doctor, the TSH reference range is 0.5 to five. Um, but we see in studies that women who have a TSH greater than 2.5 have a higher risk of miscarriage. Interesting. So we are, you know, and this is, I think, standard of care for the most part for doctors to really um, hone in on making sure that TSH is between 0.5 and 2 uh, for fertility, 2.5 at the, the, the higher end, but really important for thyroid. And it's because probably of the autoimmune response as well going on. And we know even in studies that the antibodies have an influence on miscarriage as well. So it's an extremely important um, endocrine gland to get in order for fertility. Um, so anybody who has had miscarriages, anybody who's struggling to get pregnant, we know that women who have low thyroid, it affects their periods. If they have low thyroid or high thyroid, if they have low thyroid, they tend to have heavy periods, heavy, longer periods, or they skip periods um, or have irregular bleeding. If they have high thyroid, it tends to be lighter periods and um, also can become irregular too. So you see it on both ends of the spectrum. In our patients, we do a full thyroid panel in all of our patients who are struggling fertility, and we are optimizing any suboptimal thyroid. And again, that could be addressing the diet, addressing those nutrient deficiencies to start. It doesn't mean I always put people on thyroid medication. Sometimes it's just like, okay, there's just a little something off here. How can I help your body convert your T4 to T3 better? Sure. You know, um, so there's that, but there's also a need sometimes to treat low thyroid. So what does it mean to treat the thyroid? Well, essentially it's somewhat like hormone replacement. We know that your body's not making the hormone well enough on its own. And so we're adding the bio equivalent of that hormone to your body. And there's a different 
kind of uh, philosophy of treatment, depending on who you are and how you practice. Standard endocrinologists only like to use something called levothyroxine, brand name known as Synthroid. They um, they've done that for years. It's just, you know, they believe the body is fully equipped to convert to T3. Fine. You just need Synthroid. You don't need any other blood tests, but the TSH may be a free T4, but that's pretty much it. Um, many of us who are a little bit outside of that in terms of holistic approach or integrative approach to care, see that there is a need sometimes to give the active, the full active hormone to the body. What do I mean by, by giving T3? And you can do this a couple of different ways. You can use uh, what we call a natural desiccated thyroid. And women hear brand names like Armour Thyroid or Nature Thyroid or um, NP Thyroid, West P Thyroid. Those are all natural desiccated thyroids. What's a natural desiccated thyroid? It comes from an animal source. Right now it comes from pigs. It used to come from cows, but it comes from pigs and it contains a ratio of T4 and T3. That's similar to the same ratio that humans produce in their thyroid gland. So there are many practitioners who believe that that is a better equivalent to the natural hormone that our bodies produce. And they've done studies on natural desiccated thyroid and levothyroxine, and they've seen that patients actually feel better mm -hmm. on NDT thyroid because it's actually giving them more of what they're naturally their natural bodies would produce. And I've seen that in my practice too. Does that mean I don't prescribe levothyroxine at all? No, I still do in some patients. And again, this goes to the like informing and educating my patients. I give them all of the options, right? And I tell them why some doctors do it this way. Some doctors do it this way. The third option is using a T3, like just straight up L-thyronine is what it's called. And you can use it as a compounded T3 from a compounding pharmacy, or you can get it from the regular pharmacy and it's called Cytomel. And giving T3 sometimes really helps a person actually improve their thyroid symptoms and improve their thyroid function. So in our practice um, at St. Paul the Sixth Institute, we use a lot of sustained release T3 to manage people's thyroids and fertility to really get their bodies, you could say, functioning at an endocrine like an optimum endocrine level mm -hmm. for the thyroid. And we watch levels very closely and most of our patients do extraordinarily well on it. But those are kind of your three options, T4 only, natural desiccated thyroids and T3. And I'm open to prescribing all of them. That's just the way I am. I believe in really letting a patient kind of help me decide what's best for the body. And sometimes we change, um, but that's what's cool. It's just... There isn't just one option for thyroid. And so um, women really need to know that. Yeah. I love that approach where, you know, you're not just saying this is what you'll do. You're saying these are our options. And I can imagine that if you're going the more natural route, that may take, which I, I personally love, but again, cases are different. I'm sure there's more severe cases and less severe cases. And um, I'm sure the more natural route may be, take more time. Maybe not, maybe not. I'm not sure how that works. How do you, how would you say, like, how does the time how does it compare in terms of it? Yeah. Well, if you're talking about medication, the natural desiccated thyroids and T3, they all work similarly in terms of normalizing the hormone levels, mm -hmm. but whether a person feels better yeah. soon may depend on the treatment that you chose. Sure. And, you know, it's, it's also, you know, a lot of people wonder about this other test called reverse T3. So since this is something that gets brought up often in thyroid discussions, you know, let's just talk about it a little bit. Yeah. Reverse T3 is, is actually like the kind of opposite of T3. Um, it basically, it's an inactive hormone. So it doesn't have any capability to influence at the cellular level, but it actually can block T3 from working at the cellular level, cellular level, if it's made too much. <laughs> and what we have found in science is there's actually a condition it's called euthyroid six syndrome. And you can see it in a very sick patient in the hospital where they, their body just kind of like, it's basically going into, um, I have to do everything I can to survive. So I need to shut down everything I can to divert all my energy, probably to the heart or, you know, brain, right. heart and brain. And so what happens is it starts to increase this production of reverse T3, which shuts down your thyroid T3 
three function. Um, and it makes you, you start seeing low thyroid, basically the numbers completely start to change and they call that youth thyroid six syndrome. Now there is a, a belief that that can happen at a much lower level than that trauma patient or sick patient. And that if you're super stressed out, if you're chronically adrenally functioning low, that your reverse T3 will slowly increase. And as it does, again, you're not able to utilize then your T3, the active hormone at the cellular level. And so you feel low thyroid Mm. and there are treatments like using just act you know, the actual hormone T3 to bring down reverse T3. And I do this, but I don't do it in every patient. And I think, again, you have to be careful because so true about anything in medicine is we can become micro-focused and we can almost be like, okay, this is going to be the answer to everything. Yeah. You know, like I finally found that my reverse T3 is high and this is going to be the answer to all my health issues. Sure. Nothing is a magic bullet. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, the endocrine system is a symphony. Mm -hmm. So yes, can we optimize things and help the body, but nothing is a magic bullet. So be careful in anything to just be like, Oh my gosh, I, I, this is it. This is the one thing that's going to cure me. That's just not how it works in medicine, but there are situations like if the reverse T3 is greater than 20, especially, um, that, you know, balancing that down and because revert, if you give T3, that will bring the t- reverse T3 down and allow for more active hormone to be used. So, um, so that can be important. Okay. And then in terms of like hormone replacement or what does, how does a woman function if part of her thyroid is gone? Yeah. So many women who especially have been diagnosed with Graves disease, you know, ultimately their thyroid is so out of control that they end up with like a partial thyroidectomy or even a full thyroidectomy. Um, and this is, it's sad because, you know, there's some doctors that believe you could actually reverse that through all of these kind of protocols, but ultimately it just, you know, something that to save the body you have to do. Yeah. Um, in that situation, it's, it's again, just like any hormone replacement, you just, you need hormone replacement of the thyroid if you don't have part of your thyroid and it's very easy to do. And so everyone knows, I mean, thyroid treatment actually is bioidentical. Mm-hmm. There isn't really you know, for the most part, what's available is not synthetic. I mean, synthetic in the sense that it's commercially made and there's inactive ingredients, but it is the bio equivalent of our thyroid hormone, even Synthroid is. So women need to understand that. I mean, so there's, we throw around again, this word natural, and we have to be careful about that word, but, um, so we need to kind of look at that and it just, it has to be something lifelong. Then if you don't have a thyroid, you have to take thyroid hormone lifelong. It's, it's so important, right. For our master gland of energy in order to help that thyroid to, you know, continue to make the the body work correctly. But again, there's some options. You don't have to take Synthroid. Um, and there's been a lot of myths about natural desiccated thyroid and, um, the way natural desiccated thyroid is made, especially like NP thyroid, um, and the nature thyroid is they are, um, much safer in the sense that they are, they're really testing those batches to make sure that they are what they're supposed to be in terms of the actual thyroid hormone. So that's, it's important for people to know that, you know, there's been some myths about that these hormones don't work and they actually do. Okay. It's good to know. So like Synthroid, for instance, while it's commercially made, um, if it's bioidentical, then would there be no side effects or what kind of side effects do women see when taking Synthroid? or maybe medication with thyroid. Yeah. I mean, for the most part, thyroid medication is tolerated super well and there's not, there's not side effects, but there are people who are celiac who cannot take Synthroid because it has a little bit of gluten in it. And there are some forms of thyroid that do have a little bit of gluten in it. So for a celiac patient, there is gluten-free formulations of thyroid medication. So that's something to be important, but most of the time there's no side effects. Now, if you give someone too much thyroid, they're going to feel edgy and anxious and sweaty. And, you know, they're not going to feel well, or they're going to have heart issues. Um, but that's pretty rare really to happen. Occasionally just someone doesn't feel well on a type of thyroid medication. And, you know, it might be just kind of vague symptoms, not anything specific. And again, when we switch around their medication, usually then we find the one that's right for their body. Um, but for the most part, you know, it's, it's tolerated very, very well. That's really good to know. I did not know that. Very cool. 
Well, Teresa, is there any last things? I think I'm my questions. I've asked them all. Um, I'll probably have more in the future and maybe we'd have a thyroid 2.0, uh, but there, are there any lasting comments or thoughts you want to share um, to our listeners about the thyroid and our hormones? Oh man, we've talked about a lot. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I missed. Um, we've talked about the autoimmune issue, you know, there's just so much on the internet that you can read about these things. So it can be overwhelming. So I just want to acknowledge that when I have a patient that's diagnosed with like Hashimoto's, it's really overwhelming. Sometimes the amount of information that's out there. So, you know, just take it step by step. Nothing's usually like an emergency, you know, you know, if you've got thyroid antibodies, but there's a lot of great people. I go to, um, Dr. Alan Christensen, Dr. Amy Meyer, um, to read. And, um, there's just, there's a lot of wealth of information. Dr. Weston Childs had some great information. Um, Dr. Isabella Wentz wrote a book called the Hashimoto's protocol. So great information, but I would say it can be overwhelming. And so really develop a, a relationship with your healthcare provider, one that you trust that really is on the same page with you with your thyroid. If you're getting a situation where it's just like, I don't want to give you anything, but this it's, you know, you don't need any other blood tests and that's not what you want. Then you're just going to have to find a provider that actually, you know, is on the same page with what you desire for your evaluation and treatment. Um, so this is again, just great information to advocate for your health and know as women that thyroid is a very common condition and it really should be screened. in most women after the age of 30 and certainly by the age of 40, um, just because sometimes we'll find find it in people who didn't realize they had it like my sister, you know, um, and it can make such a profound improvement in your health to have it treated. I'll never forget my sister when she got on thyroid medication within the first few months, she lost 15 pounds. Oh my gosh. Can you imagine like someone who struggled with their weight and didn't realize that it was going to be that easy to help because she had this condition. So it can be pretty profound to know that, you know, you can feel so much better with getting the right treatment for your thyroid. So advocate for yourself, learn more. And, um, yeah, just grateful to be able to do this kind of more in-depth look at the thyroid. Teresa, I love doing these Q and A's with you. <laughs> I learned so much and I just got to sit back and relax and let you just, you know, teach the world. So it's so fun. Thank you so much, Teresa. Um, to our listeners, we can put together like a little toolkit again, um, yeah. Teresa's recommendations and maybe some of the, uh, those recommended labs that you can ask your doctor, um, to run for you. Uh, and yeah, for every woman out there listening who has that dry hair, the dry nails, difficulty losing weight, um, and all the other things, or maybe it's again, the hyper where your heart rate is just racing and you're anxious and sweaty and all those things. Um, this may not be in your, in your head, but you know what, go to your doctor, get some lab work and see for sure. And, um, again, be looking for that PDF. Um, if you're wanting that PDF, um, email the hormone genius at gmail.com and we will email that to you. Be looking for a more automated way to get the PDF through our website here in the next couple months. Um, and we're just so blessed to be on this journey with you. Thanks for listening to the hormone genius podcast. Please remember to share our podcast with your friends and family and also follow us on social media. If you were not aware, we have a YouTube channel. So if you could like and subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay in the loop with all of our latest episodes, we would appreciate that. Thank you so much for your support. We are excited to journey alongside you as you discover the beauty and the genius of your hormones.